Mark uh, Harris from the uh, University of Edinburgh. He will be speaking about the Terra theories, science, and modern reception history of the Exodus. Thank you. I'm going to talk about something rather different, although it's still the volcano. I want to give an overview of what this volcano means, really, and what's been done with it. Now, my interest as a, as a one-time geologist, now theologian, so my interest as a one-time geologist and now theologian, not biblical scholar, is in how science relates to the big narratives of faith, and this is where I want to bring in the history question and what exactly it means towards the end. And the Exodus is a particularly revealing test case for this, as becomes clear when you look at how scientists have used the, this legendary Bronze Age volcano of Thera and compare it with what biblical scholars say about the matter. And what you find is that these two very different types of scholars do not really see eye to eye on the matter. So on the one hand, you find a substantial body of published material, and I include in that things like uh, internet sites, blockbuster books and TV documentaries that use Thera and its Minoan eruption as a naturalistic, naturalistic explanation for all sorts of things, including the legend of Atlantis and the plagues and the sea crossing of Exodus. And I'll refer to all of those just for convenience as the Thera theories. Biblical scholarship, on the other hand, has shown very little interest in naturalistic explanations and particularly the Thera theories. Instead, it tends to emphasize, as we know, human and textual factors instead. Now, there's any number of reasons for this difference in attitude towards the Thera theories, but one of the most important of them is that, frankly, the Thera theories have something of a credibility issue. And here is what Miller and Hayes say about them in their classic book, A History of Ancient Israel and Judah. Theories of this sort attempt to give naturalistic and scientifically acceptable explanations for the more fantastic and miraculous biblical claims. In our opinion, however, these theories presuppose such hypothetical scenarios, such a catastrophic view of history, and such marvelous correlations of coincidental factors that they create more credibility problems of their own than the ones they're intended to solve. Are Miller and Hayes right? to dismiss scientific treatments of the Exodus in this way? I think the answer to that is not a simple yes or no, as I hope to explain. First, I'll set out the basic parameters, what we do know about this eruption, before describing some of the, the more outlandish Thera theories. And the theme I plan to explore in this, because I'm a theologian, is imagination. And I want to look at the question of how modern science and imagination affect the diff very different ways in which this volcano is used and how it is used to, uh, for this preeminent text of the Bible and, of course, its outlandish miracle stories. So what do we know about Thera and its effect on the Bronze Age world? <coughs> Unfortunately, much less than we'd like. So we've been talking about the radiocarbon date, and I would be perfectly happy to settle on the, the late 17th century, but of course we've noted that this is controversial, and equally controversial is Thera's effect on nearby civilizations. We have no eyewitness reports or clear evidence that any civilizations were adversely affected by it, except of course for the people who lived on the island, the people of Akrotiri. As far as we know, they all left the island before the eruption got really serious because no bodies have been found. So it's a very different situation from Pompeii. But what it means is that although we have abundant geological evidence for this Minoan eruption, we have no clear textual or archaeological evidence that any human beings were seriously affected by it beyond those who, who left the island. That's not to say that no one was affected. It's just that we have no evidence for it. And this point underscores what might be called the paradox of Thera, that a very sizable volcanic eruption occurred in the midst of any number of Bronze Age and Eastern Mediterranean cultures, but it left no clear mark on them that we know of. 
And it's worth bearing this in mind as we look at some of the theory of theories which claim that this volcano was, was decisive in causing any number of cultural upheavals and cataclysms, of course, the demise of the Minoans on Crete, and that it's reflected in legends like Atlantis and, of course, in the Exodus. And I think what we have to say is that the nature of the evidence available means that these kinds of naturalistic explanations that I'm going to talk about are really imaginative conjectures. There's that word imagination again. So I think the caution is in order. Now, what can we positively know about the eruption? What have science and archaeology established about it? Well, we believe that it took place over three or four stages, spread out over days, perhaps weeks. The third explosive stage was the most spectacular, and that had a volcanic explosivity index of perhaps seven. And for comparison, this comparison is often made, the famous eruption of Krakatau in 1883 had a VEI of up to perhaps 6.5, somewhere sort of floating between 6 and 6.5. Now, notice that this number, the VEI, works on a logarithmic scale, so it means that Thera was several times more explosive than Krakatau, and much more again than Mount St. Helens in 1980, which had a, a paltry 5. So, of course, that puts Thera in what's called the, uh, the super-colossal end of the spectrum, which makes it unusually, unusually large, of course, but not uniquely so. Now, there's a very good reason why Thera is invariably compared with Krakatau, and that's largely to do with its tsunamis. Potentially, the most devastating effect, effect of this eruption, its tsunamis, are actually the hardest part to trace. And that's why Krakatau is useful as an analogy. Both Thera and Krakatau involved very explosive eruptions of the Plinian type, like Vesuvius. And both were island volcanoes that essentially blew themselves to pieces collapsing to leave a caldera and potentially producing gigantic waves in the process. Now, the eruption of, of Krakatau is very well documented, including eyewitness testimony, and we know that it killed up to perhaps 40,000 people, largely on account of the enormous tsunamis generated. And Thera also seems to have generated tsunamis because there's evidence of tsunami deposits in several places on the coasts of Turkey and Crete. And you have a map there of a few, few places that have been looked at, and that's a tsunami deposit on the, uh, at Palacastro on the coast of Crete. However, we must be careful that the analogy with Krakatau doesn't lead us to make unwarranted claims. Sure, both volcanoes produce calderas, but caldera collapse is just one of the factors in generating tsunamis in this kind of eruption. In any case, it's now realized that Thera already had a caldera before the Minoan eruption, which means that any collapse wasn't as great as had been supposed previously. It's also possible that what collapse there was took place slowly over hours rather than minutes, meaning that any tsunamis would be correspondingly smaller. And this has all meant that there's been great uncertainty in the literature recently about the extent and the magnitude of these all-important tsunamis from Thera. They may well have been confined largely to the Aegean, and if so, it would be unlikely that Egypt really was at all affected by them in any serious way. And that would be a very, very serious blow for the Thera theories. Now, a closely related issue to this is the ash cloud produced by Thera. This volcano ejected perhaps as much as nearly 100 cubic kilometers of rock into the sea and air. So there was a, clear, you know, a huge plume of, uh, of volcanic tephra going right up into the atmos upper atmosphere. Like the tsunamis, the ash cloud and the fallout of ash from it are absolutely crucial for these Thera theories. Did it make agriculture on Crete impossible? Did it extend over Egypt, turning the Nile red and casting darkness over the land, thus explaining the plague narratives? Well, as with the tsunamis, we need to be careful. Recent work suggests that the ash cloud extended mostly east of Thera, and I'll go back to the map so you can see. Rhodes, for instance, seems to have suffered from quite extensive ashfall, although it doesn't appear to have affected the culture, the Minoan culture on the island there. Crete, of course, the Minoan heartland, seems to have been even less affected by the ashfall, although there was some. And Egypt, well, we just don't really know, although some has been found there, very small traces in the Nile Delta. Beatak, though, considers it 
quotes, highly unlikely that Egypt was shrouded in a cloud of volcanic ash. If so, those theory theories that call upon the ash cloud to explain the plagues of Egypt are really looking rather dubious. So to sum up where we've got so far, and of course I haven't even told you any of the theory theories yet, um, we have a very significant volcano erupting in the middle of the Aegean, probably late 17th century, and although we can't determine other parameters reasonably well, the ones that are important to the theory theories, namely the extent of the tsunamis and the ash cloud, are really looking quite controversial. Nevertheless, and this is the important point, this volcano remains, right up to this day, a rich resource for the imagination, as you will find out if you Google things like Thera Exodus or Thera Moses. We have precious little evidence that Thera affected nearby civilizations, yet we know that those same civilizations went through periods of great turbulence towards the end of the Middle Bronze Age. And that's the entire basis of the Thera theories, really, that this volcano supplies one easy explanation for a rather turbulent and mysterious stretch of history. Well, I'll, I'll start to tell you now about a few representative selection a, a, a representative selection of theory theories. I'm going to be very selective because there are lots and lots of them. Well, first is, the, is really the grandfather of them all, the venerable Greek archaeologist Spiridon Marinatos, who proposed in 1939 that theorem might explain, explain the demise of the Minoans on Crete. And very significantly, Marinatos was also the first to call upon Krakatau to fill in the huge blanks in our knowledge about how Thera might have affected humans. And this is the all-important quote from his paper. No historical account survives, of Thera that is, but fortunately we have an excellent means of reconstructing all the phenomena which accompanied the disaster in the eruption of Krakatau. So what Marinatos basically does is to transfer what we know about Krakatau to the Aegean. And he describes this vast apocalypse on Minoan Crete as giant waves come and obliterate uh, the coastal towns, and there are earthquakes, lightning, and a rain of red-hot ash falling from the sky inland. And he says that after such an onslaught like this, an irreparable blow, Minoan civilization could hardly last. And a point that should be made from this is that ever since Marinatos made this suggestion, it's been made in every single theory theory since, and what I think is really that the widespread fascination with Thera is really a widespread fascination with Krakatau. Anyway, Marinatos' idea became linked with Plato and his account of the destruction of Atlantis, although Marinatos himself was actually quite careful not to make too much of this. Galanopoulos and Bacon, on the other hand, had no such qualms in their well-known kind of coffee table book of 1969, Atlantis, the truth behind the legend, and this takes Plato's story and remoulds it. So they take the ring-like geography of Atlantis that Plato describes, and they rescale it, take it from the, Atlant the Atlantic Ocean to um, the Aegean, and plop it on top of Thera, so that it sits on top of the, uh, the modern-day circular caldera of Santorini. And so Thera effectively becomes, together with Crete, the home of this legendary civilization of Atlantis, the people that we know as the Minoans, destroyed by this volcano. And since they were working with an eruption date way back then, this is 1969, their date was 1450 BCE, they meant they were, that meant they were able to bring the exodus into play by means of the traditional date. So they were able to answer a number of problems in one. So in their model, Thera is the decisive spur that allows for the Israelites to escape from Egypt. So they explain the first nine plagues as the sequence of natural events that might be expected from the, from the ash cloud. And they can also explain the sea crossing, as long as you understand the Yam Suf in the text as Lake Serbonis. And here's a plot from Google Earth just showing you Lake Serbonis as it looks today. They have the Israelites just happen to be standing on the spit of land across the lagoon as the distant Thera collapses and its magma chamber fills with seawater. And the sea ebbs away, of course. The Israelites just have time to, uh, to run across the lagoon before the tsunamis come crashing in, taking the pursuing Egyptians by surprise. An awful lot of coincidences there, I'm sure you can see. Now, despite many problems, this basic model of Galanopoulos and Bacon has really caught hold in the theory theories, and you find it recycled again and again in the subsequent theory theories, sometimes taking into account this new radiocarbon date of 
the late 17th century, and that basically means equating the Israelites with the Hyksos. And I'll describe briefly the two most recent approaches that have been published. I love these two. Um, the first one is by the geologist Barbara Sivertson, who published her study, The Parting of the Sea, in 2009. And her subtitle explains her, her approach very well. How Volcanoes, Earthquakes, and Plagues Shaped the Story of Exodus. This book is not just about the Minoan eruption of Thera, but a whole portfolio of natural disasters that, she believes, explain what we read in the text of the Exodus. She has three different volcanoes, not just Thera, and there are earthquakes, tsunamis, a hurricane wind, climate change, as well as several diseases. In fact, she says that natural catastrophe, catastrophe shapes the whole Exodus narrative, and there are very few human actions that aren't a direct response to natural apocalypse. And I must admit that as I read the book, um, the picture formed itself in my, in my mind of these humans just running screaming from one disaster to another. So, I mean, you know, there's a high degree of imagination going on here. Now, in common with earlier theory theories, Sivertson tends to read the text quite literally when a naturalistic explanation presents itself. Otherwise, she tends to treat it rather loosely. So, for example, Here's, I, I find this an amazingly literal um, reading. This is a theophany of Exodus 24, where God is described having under his feet something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And Sivertson takes this as a sign that the vision takes place on the Harat al-Raha volcano in Arabia because, she says, it's unusually rich in olivine crystals, Usually green, Sivertson explains, they can appear blue. Now, I've never seen a blue olivine. They've always absolutely green to me, but this is what she says, and that's why she places Mount Sinai on Harat Eraha. On the other hand, she takes a much less literal approach when she interprets the text as pointing to two different exoduses separated by 178 years, with two sea crossings and each with its own, own volcanic eruption. So the first exodus has Thera erupting in the late 17th century and causing the first nine plagues. That terrifies the Asiatics, the, the Hyksos, to flee. There's a sea crossing, that's um, the wind set down model, and th then the people come to a ho the holy mountain, which is the volcano in Ara Arabia, and so on to Canaan. That's the first exodus, and the second exodus takes place uh, 178 years later. And here we find that the Egyptian royal children experience a terrible bout of food poisoning, that's the tenth plague, and some Asiatic slaves take their chances of, in all this confusion and escape, fleeing to the Mediterranean coast, but it turns out hotly pursued by the Egyptian army. Thankfully, there's another volcanic eruption, and the slaves are delivered, this time by a tsunami that destroys the Egyptians. Now, of course, Thera erupted nearly two centuries earlier, so she has to call upon another volcano to explain this, and she talks about one of the underwater volcanoes in the Aegean. Now, clearly this is a very elaborate, naturalistic approach, although I think I prefer just to call it a kind of good old-fashioned apocalypse, really. And there are hermeneutical problems with the way she reads the text. Now, I'll leave those for another day simply to present um, the most, very most recent theory, theory, which is even more elaborate. This is by the engineer, Rian Boyson, his study, Thera and the Exodus of 2012. And he makes it clear from the beginning that he's not doing this to try to explain any miracles. He doesn't believe in miracles. Everything in the text must be explained naturalistically or else be rejected. And the irony is that having said that, he's able to explain the plagues and the sea crossing entirely naturalistically. In fact, he does it so well that he multiplies them. So there's not one, but three eruptions of Thera. So it's a real intensification over Sivertson. He, has, he also has an Acidos, that's the entry of the Hyksos into Egypt, and two Hyksos Exodos, Exoduses. Each, each one, each of these three events, is facilitated by a different eruption of Thera. So this means that we have three sea events in the book. There are three tsunamis sweeping the Egyptians away three times. You'd think they would have learned their lesson the first time. Anyway, I, I don't want to make fun of it. I mean, I think this is fantastic data for the way that science and, and the Bible is being used in the popular imagination here. Um, the ingenuity, though, is really quite remarkable. 
But it illustrates a wider trend in these theory theories towards increasing complexity and therefore rem more remarkable coincidences and unlikelihoods. Is this a problem? Well, cleaning up for the scientists who, who formulate these theory theories, but I think for those in the Guild of Professional Bible Scholars, yes, it would appear that there's a credibility issue here, as that skeptical quote I read out to you from Miller and Hayes at the beginning makes clear. There's a caution towards models that rely on tiny probabilities and elaborate conjectures. Now, it's probably clear that I sympathize with that caution, and I'm something of a skeptic myself. I think, personally, that it's unlikely that Thera had a part to play in the historical events standing behind the Exodus, whatever they were. On the other hand, I am interested in the hermeneutical assumptions underlying the various ways that this text is, is looked at. And at this point, I'll conclude. When we read the plague texts and the sea crossing, we're clearly being asked to imagine something quite extraordinary, something quite implausible, really, something quite apocalyptic. How do we do that? Well, it seems to me that the theory theories are actually a help here, not a hindrance in this imaginative task, as long as we put history to one side. And from that point of view, I think they certainly complement if not improve upon. Uh, Greta Hort's famous naturalistic model of the plagues, if you remember, she explains the plagues as intensifications of natural phenomena that are already well known in Egypt, like the Kamsin, the desert sandstorm. She explains that for the plague of darkness. Well, Hort's model has a tendency to downplay the spectacular elements of the narrative. The theory theories, of course, amplify them. And I think that it's at this level that of imaginative reading that the theory theories are actually most effective. There's even a sense in which the theory theories could be seen to stand alongside other forms of Bible reading in the postmodern proliferation, and I'm thinking of things like liberation readings, for instance, or feminist readings, socio-political readings, and so on. The theory theories give us scientific readings. They're there, they challenge or they inspire the imagination without necessarily requiring a firm historical commitment that this is what really happened. The historical question won't go away, though. And I wanted to finish with a comment on this because it has occupied this conference so much in the last few days. As, from the perspective of a modern theologian, caught up in the middle of what's clearly a very complex debate. Some of us here clearly want to maintain that it's intellectually indefensible to read the Exodus text as speaking of concrete historical or geological events, and other, others of us will continue to press the question of what really happened. Well, my own position, I must confess that I'm somewhat agnostic on this myself, but I am interested in the different theological presuppositions that we bring to this exercise, particularly when the problematic concept of miracle is in view. And just to illustrate that, Professor Deva made a very important point, I thought, about naturalistic explanations in his talk on Saturday. He said that, and I quote, scientific explanations of the miracles miss the point. I agree, but I also want to note that this is a theological statement, not historical, still less archaeological. Whether we avoid naturalistic explanations or embrace them, I think that we invariably do so on theological grounds. In any case, I'm not actually that convinced that we can avoid naturalistic readings of these miracles or signs of the Exodus. After all, the text itself frames most of them as signs of nature. In other words, the text itself makes naturalistic claims. And my conclusion from all this is that whichever way we read these pivotal texts in the Exodus narrative, whether as a series of signs or folk tales or Egyptian parallels or historical or geological events, there's a silent theological discussion going on here that I think also needs to be brought into the open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much for this uh, highly interesting uh, presentation. I wish to uh, throw in another piece of information with your permission. Uh, regarding the volcanic uh, cloud over Egypt, yes or no. 
About 10 years ago, a volcanologist from the University of Vienna, Max Bichler, whom you probably know, came to uh, Israel to work uh, in several excavations and try to locate volcanic ash from Terra in the sections which cover the period of time between the, let's say, later phases of the middle bones and the beginning of the late bones, including with us at Megiddo. And the result was completely negative, which means no site in Israel produced evidence for uh, the Terra eruption. The conclusion of Max Bichler, he published uh, his results in several places, including the Megiddo reports. The conclusion was that the uh, volcanic uh, cloud was blown to the east, as he said, or northeast, not to the Levant, um, let alone Egypt in the south. Aaron? Aaron Mayer. Um, I'd like to add two things. One is that um, most often the people who uh, put out these books, such as those two books that you uh, quoted, and I read the first one, and if you look at her biography, besides being the manuscript editor of a relatively important geological journal, she's written several books which have the connect which I don't remember what they were, but they have as much connection to the Exodus as uh, the art of, um, of uh, paper, you know, a Japanese paper folding. Um, and these people usually are, are simply not in the field, and it's, I don't even think you can call it scientific inquiry, because even though they may know something about a specific aspect related to the field, they really not are do they're not doing scientific research, and I think it's, it's no better than that, um, the movie put out by uh, Jacobici on the Exodus Code, it's more or less the same thing. Um, uh, another issue which is, uh, re uh, relates to theology is, um, I know at least from Jewish theology, such as Maimonides, and I think, it, if I remember correctly, there's a more or less parallel phenomena in Christian and Muslim the theology as well that attempts to explain miracles within the natural laws. So I think that might be a continuation of uh, tendencies that, you, uh, that go back many, many centuries. Thank you, yes. Um, your first point, I mean, that, that is very, very interesting. Of course, the, the Sivertson book was published by the University of Princeton Press, so a very, very serious, weighty press there. The book is full of, of um, footnotes to many of you here, um, full, of, full of scholarship and learning about Exodus and biblical scholarship, and yet this approach is taken. Now, that is one particular example. I could have given you many more of the kind of blockbuster Indiana Jones types of book that have been written on the theory of theories. Um, I thought you'd be more interested in a scholarly approach. Um, but I'm sure... Yeah, I mean, part, partly, partly what's going on here is, is, is what happens when one, a scholar steps into another field. I mean, it's interesting, I think, that scientists often get these kinds of things published. But also what is going on is, of course, the, the, the text of the Exodus is out there for anyone to read. And I'm interested in the way everyone reads it, not just one particular type of, of scholar. I'm interested in the way scientists, I'm scientists, theologian, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the way scientists look at the text and they see all sorts of things in it that we don't and think that that is the answer. And, you know, we have our own answers. We have theological reasons for saying that, she has her own. And I, I'm, try, I'm trying to look at the kind of, you know, the different portfolio, for, oh, I'll start again, the, the different portfolios of, of uh, interpretation that go on of this, this legendary text. Um, your second point, sorry, what was, uh, yes, Maimonides and the, the, the interpretation of miracles. Yeah, mir the theology of miracles is an extremely problematic issue and has been, as I'm sure you're aware, been going on for uh, hundreds if not thousands of years um, and our approach to miracles is very much informed by our own personal theology, and for many of us it's inform informed by David Hume, who basically put miracles out of court. Whether that's an appropriate view of miracles or not, well, a philosopher of religion would say something different from me, but um, what I'm trying to get at in this paper is simply to start to get us sort of asking, well, why, is it, why, what do we th why do we think these things? What are the presuppositions underneath? May I ask a question since I have a microphone? Scott Nagel. I'm wondering if uh, what we're not seeing here is sort of a theological view of popular culture. 
more than anything. And I'm wondering if you would draw any parallels to the um, innumerable discoveries of Noah's Ark. Um, I'm told to keep it very, very short. Um, I don't really want to go to Noah's Ark, or archaeology as it's called, because I mean, that, that is taking things way beyond the boundary of, of Princeton University Press and so on. I, this is why I, I want to stick with more, more scholarly approaches. Um, but there is a fascination... I, I just want to make it the, the simple point that there is a fascination with the Bible in the po popular imagination, and there is a fascination with science. And when the two get together, you literally get an explosive combination... Thank you. Thank you very much.